Hello friends, how are you? Hope you are all healthy and happy, have you ever wondered about Blum Voss? Today we're diving deep into this topic, the one I want to look at today is like an alien. It looks like something from Star Wars, maybe it's run by a little future Jedi slash future Sith, and a guy from the future who is very fertile. This is the Blum Voss P.170. The bomber, now in the field of military bombers, is usually the most visible of the big behemoths. They are slow moving, armed with a lot of turrets, and heavily defended. They often require escorts, and while they're quite vulnerable themselves, their very high payloads and large operational range give them great destructive power, making them ideal for missions like bombing entire cities at once. While this type of bomber was in demand by the US Air Force and the British Royal Air Force, the German Luftwaffe tended to stick to a different bomber concept called the Schnellbomber, or Fast Bomber. This fast bomber prioritized speed over payload and defense. The idea behind these bombers was that they would carry smaller payloads and only minimal defensive weapons, if any. Replacing defensive turrets with high speed allowed them to reduce drag caused by gun barrels protruding from the body, and removing heavy armaments meant they could maintain optimal performance. Instead, they were equipped with powerful engines that gave them very high speed for military aircraft. Due to their speed, they could outrun enemy aircraft and while they didn't have the same destructive power as conventional bombers, they could operate without an escort. This meant the German Luftwaffe didn't have to spend additional time and resources on escort aircraft, freeing those resources for other missions. However, the main problem with many Schnellbomber projects was that, with many Schnellbomber projects, advances in aviation technology quickly meant that what was once a high-speed bomber became just an average speed bomber within a few years. A good example of this is the Junkers Ju-88, when it first flew in late 1936, it could reach speeds of over 360 miles per hour, which was very fast for a bomber at that time. However, by 1936, fighter planes were achieving speeds of around 300 miles per hour, and within just a few years, fighters were able to far exceed that, making the true blue Schnell bomber concept of a high-speed, defenseless bomber difficult to maintain. To stay viable, these bombers needed to always be at the cutting edge of technology, it's likely because of this flexibility that many of the so-called Schnell bombers, like the Ju-88, ended up being outfitted with defensive weapons, albeit not as heavily armed as the larger, slower bombers. Nazi Germany had a particular interest in the Schnell bomber concept and was continually exploring new designs for them during the war. In 1942, Blum Voss, led by engineer Richard Vogt, entered this field with the P.170. Measuring 13 meters long and 16 meters wide, the P.170 had a unique layout with three engines, one in the center and one on each wingtip. Each engine was a BMW 801, delivering 1,860 horsepower, allowing the aircraft to achieve a top speed of approximately 510 miles per hour. The two engines on the wings featured counter-rotating propellers to improve performance. This configuration had two main effects. It reduced the negative impacts of engine torque, which occurs when the propeller causes rotational force in a certain direction, and it allowed the wing-mounted propellers to create opposing forces, thereby producing a counter-rotating effect. This counter-rotating force could oppose torque, and a second possible effect could be a reduction in drag. Wing propellers can create a vortex of air behind them, which causes drag and reduces speed and performance. Each wingtip propeller if made to rotate in the opposite direction of this natural vortex, could cancel out much of this drag, greatly improving the aircraft's overall performance. However, there are significant reasons why wing-mounted propellers are rare. This design would require the wings to be heavily reinforced to carry the engine's weight, and if one of the external engines failed, it would cause substantial asymmetric thrust more than in a typical multi-engine aircraft. This might be why designers often shy away from this engine layout while it appears occasionally, it remains uncommon. In the case of the P.170, with its three engines, the asymmetric thrust issue wouldn't be as problematic if a wingtip engine failed since the central engine could help balance out the thrust from the remaining engine. The P.170 did have a significant issue with weight distribution. Due to the placement of the wings and engines, the bulk of the plane's weight was located forward of the fuselage and ahead of the wing itself. 
This would result in the P.170 being very front heavy and unbalanced if it had a typical cockpit structure. To help balance the weight, the cockpit would need to be positioned far back along the fuselage, behind the wings. This placement gave the P.170 its unique appearance, with a cockpit reminiscent of a Star Wars pod. The pilot would be seated in the main cockpit at the very back, while the observer bombardier would sit in a separate cylindrical observation glass compartment further along the fuselage. Although there's no exact reason documented for this design choice, it's likely that it was meant to give the bombardier better visibility than would have been possible otherwise, despite the unusual second cockpit. In 1942, instead of a separate placement for the Bombardier, the P.170 extended the main workspace. It continued with the unusual tail configuration that, from a top view, seems typical, but from the side its oddity is clear. In the tail, where the cockpit is located, there's no vertical fin or rudder. Instead of a vertical fin or rudder, the P.170 has two small fins on each wingtip, at the rear of the engine nacelles. While this design choice was likely made with specific stability or control benefits in mind, I'm not entirely certain of the exact advantages. However, I do know of another aircraft with this wingtip midpoint rudder design, and it faced considerable stability issues. This suggests that such a rudder configuration might not be as ideal for flight stability. The P.170's three engines, spread widely across the aircraft, required proper weight distribution for balance. Each nacelle had a wheel underneath it for support, and the tail also had a small wheel to keep it and the cockpit low to the ground. This is not an unusual design element, but I thought it worth mentioning. Regarding the P.170's armament, as a pure dive bomber, it lacked guns but could carry up to 2,000 kilograms of bombs in a standard load and up to 12 rockets in six clusters under each wing on either side of the fuselage. Due to its projected speed, the P.170 may have functioned closer to a dive bomber than a typical bomber. However, it likely would not have reached production due to the inherent complexities and limitations of the design. Jet engine testing was underway, although jet aircraft were not yet deployed. By 1942, while the P.170 was being designed, testing on the jet-powered Mi-262 was already progressing rapidly, and it would eventually be deployed later in the war. The Mi-262, a fighter aircraft, could be equipped with rockets, bombs and guns while achieving high speeds with its jet engines. Using a more conventional design, it likely wouldn't require as much trial and error to get it operational, 